Hello, everyone. This is Joe. Uh, welcome to the the new episode of uh, Streaming Cafe In. And this time, we are inviting Tim, the uh, VP of Data in Quick, right? Um, maybe you can introduce yourself to the audience. All right. Hey, folks. Thanks for having me on, Joe. So I'm Tun Shui. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm the VP of Data, and I also look after DevRel at Quix, and we are a platform that is Python first. So we help Python developers create event-driven applications. So um, we manage a lot of the streaming technology for you, so you don't have to worry about infrastructure. You just worry about writing code with your favorite libraries. Um, so yeah, that's in a nutshell what we are. Cool. And uh, yeah, again, thank you for joining this uh, new podcast. Uh, the title of this is the streaming. Caffeine and uh, again, uh, I guess uh, more than coffee, many other stuff such as Coke or tea have caffeine. But uh, but I, I chat with you briefly, and I know you are a big fan of coffee, even richer experience in coffee. So uh, maybe we can. Uh, by the way, what kind of coffee you bring today? Making sure we're oh, on yeah, the on the right. Yeah, it's <laughs> a mix of coffee. Like so, officially, I'm a black coffee drinker. Um, today, I'm drinking. Um, yeah, my partner got me into drinking uh, coffee with a bit of oat cream in it. So that's what we have here today. Um, this is not my favorite mug as well. So I'm going to hold that up. I don't know if it's going to focus, but yeah, this is my favorite mug because um, I'm a big fan of mushrooms and um, surprises, I guess. Okay. <laughs> and um, the coffee that I'm drinking, I brought a couple because we kind of rotate them. This one is from um, Edinburgh in Scotland. It's roasted up there. It's called... Uh, ride and grind. So if you're a Simpsons fan, you'll probably understand wow. what there is, yeah? <laughs> How are you, um, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the other one is, um, it's called Rising Grand. They're a Cornish roastery, a small one. So hopefully wow. you can see that if it focuses. Yeah, nice. so that's what I do. I buy them um, as beans. And I brought my grinder along as well. So I use like a hand grinder. So this is from a company called Hario that everyone who's into coffee would understand. They're from Japan. And this is just like this beautiful mechanical grinder that um, tucks away very nicely and is meant to be on display at all times in your bookcase. So when I get my bookcase, I'll put it up there. But um, yeah, um, I just like, I mean, obviously fresh coffee, like big difference between getting it pre-ground or grinding it yourself. And I just find it's great for waking up in the morning. It's just like turning this thing and doing this physical activity <laughs> in the morning. It makes you feel like you're, you're waking up and earning that coffee. So I love it. Okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, yourself, what are you yeah, to? I, I let me turn this camera. I guess uh, I, I I'm trying this uh, air press today, right? So you can just uh, pour water into it and uh, just and the press, right? So this is fairly simple. I, I do have a, a kind of a special machine at home, but uh, this is actually quite fun. You can just uh, press. I, I, I will I will yeah, let me put that here. This cannot be done single hand. So again, um, I, I I tried uh, different ways uh, to make coffees like mocha with uh, air espresso, with drip, with espresso, with other ways. Uh, I would say each way, there's no really good way or bad way. Right? It's just different, and uh, it's very interesting and fascinating to see different uh, kind of a creative way to making coffees. Oh yeah, I should mention like, so at the moment um, I use the V60, so it's a filter. So we have like, there's a Chemex and there's just like a one cup V60. So um, for those who don't know, you just put like a paper filter in like a cone mm -hmm. yeah. and then you pour over much like what Joe was doing. You've, like he's got a fancy kettle, like it's <laughs> really skinny spat so you can control the flow. Like, um, so that's kind of like how I normally drink it. Um, I never got an AeroPress, I came so close. Oh yeah, cheers by the way. <laughs> um, cheers. Hmm. I never bought um, an AeroPress. I came so close each time, but it just made me think like the benefit of AeroPress is to go really fast, right? So as we talk about stream processing, it's like getting the value <laughs> out of it as quickly as possible. Um, in some ways, I'm just kind of like, I like the slow process. So in, in with my coffee, maybe it's batch <laughs> uh, until I get an AeroPress. No, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong for batch or streaming, right? It, as long as you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, like I always talk about, um, when I've given talks about um, batch versus streaming, they always, it's always phrased as, which one should you do? And I always say and, because um, I live in an and world, not an all world, right? So you can yeah. have both. And um, the applications of both are you know, very well understood. Go up and read about them. Um, same way with AeroPress. Like, sometimes <laughs> it's just convenient, right? And you just need that caffeine now. <laughs> yeah, cool. It's pretty well. Yeah, yeah I, I think that that's echoed to 
I'm echo to this and because the, this uh, idea of this uh, uh, forecast or uh, kind of interview slash uh, communication or talk with different folks is really try to invite people in this domain, uh, no matter data streaming, batch data engineering, or platform engineering. And uh, uh, if the guests happen to be a big fan of coffee, that'd be great. If they drink tea, drink other things, perfectly okay. And this, we try to be very casual and honest and sharing our experience, lessons learned, uh, or our thoughts. Some thoughts can be controversial, so uh, uh, so it's, it should be a very casual and relaxing way. Uh, we, we do have rough idea about what we've been talking, but it's, it's not script at all. So there might be some surprises. I even don't know a real kind of person likes surprises. So maybe to uh, maybe tell me more about uh, what's your day to day job, because when people see your title like VP of data and they might roughly know what it's about, but not that exactly sure. Can you share more about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess it's different everywhere, as you say. Um... At Quix, um, it's interesting because um, the persona for you know the longest time for us was like data professionals. So being in um, leadership and being able to have a strategic hand in pointing the direction for how we should position our product and how we should build, like that's where my job would come in. I'm also looking after developer relations as well, so doing the DevRel side. So um, a lot of that is about education. Um, you know, as, as we know, like streaming is one of those things where a lot of companies are very early on in that adoption, right? So there's still a lot of gaps there. So a lot of education missing. So um, allows me to draw on my experience and create content. So, you know, why we're talking today, it's, a, it's part of that. It's just to help everyone understand. So day to day, um, it's really about, um, you know, building really good demos, um, building good content. Um, and the other fun thing about, I guess, working in a startup is, you get to see other people in other startups or your peers or you know people at a similar level or just ahead of you. And um, it just helps you to learn um, and you all learn together. So it's really a rising uh, tide for everyone. So I love being able to just reach out very easily to other founders and other companies, other VPs of data, just to say hello and have a conversation. So for the most part, there's a lot of talking. Um, there's a lot of like, it's, it's kind of split between management and individual contributor, I'd say. Um, in larger companies, a VP of data looks um, a lot after um, things like governance, so like data quality, measuring, um, KPIs. Um, there's a lot more to it there, like, and probably more on the analytics side as well, because in larger companies, um, you live and die by you know, your metrics going upwards. Um, in startups, you're looking for product market fit. You're looking for the right metrics sometimes. Um, the things you've used before maybe aren't relevant today, so it's a... It's a kind of more dynamic environment. So, um, yeah, in, in this current role, yeah, a lot of it is just what we're doing here today. It's just like learning and figuring out how we can enable others to build and um, think about the art of the possible, basically, like the unknown future. How do you build that? Cool. I guess this, uh, uh, say, have a separate uh, leadership role about the data. I guess it's relatively new, right? Maybe the recent would be five years. I don't know, maybe seven years. Um, and how do you get there? I mean, can you share a little bit about your journey? Your, your books are both background and why you get studied for this kind of uh, work? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no way. I've been in the industry <laughs> for about 20 years, so like probably about the same amount of time as you. So let's try and distill that down. So um, I started off in uh, kind of life science. So I used to be a geneticist, and um, this was back in like the late 90s. Um, and at that time, you might have heard of the Human Genome Project. So this was about um, this new discipline of taking uh, essentially like statisticians or molecular biologists and teaching them to code and making them solve, um, you know, algorithm problems like using um, um, all your all the algorithms that are well established in math to solve um, molecular bi biology problems. So um, I got into genomics and. Um, I've always owned a computer, so it led me down the path of bioinformatics, which is really about sequencing the human genome, figuring out like how all the bits fit together. So it kind of started there. Um, and I was a software engineer for you know the longest time, did back end, front end, you know, native mobile apps, did everything. But about it was around 2015, I could see this like movement towards 
you know, the importance of data in building applications. And then, you know, this humble new creature appeared on the scene called a data scientist. And I was like, oh, they're very interesting. I want to work with them. And so I, my software engineering career kind of took a turn towards working with data personas, so analysts and more data scientists. Like, and it was a time when the Spotify model of the squads was really popular as well. So, um, you know, you would all be in the same team. It wasn't like a data science department. It was like they were in your team. So being a bit of um, practice things like pair programming and learning from them. I just found it such a really interesting way to work. And so uh, I started out in recommender systems, um, worked in like finance for a bit um, on click propensity models, like lots of different things like that. But um, largely as a data engineer and then uh, into management for a few years. So um, more at the kind of organizational governance levels after that. So yeah, a bit of everything. Okay, cool, yeah. Yeah, and by the way, I, when you're talking, I cannot uh, help you checking the, that, is that surfboard behind you? Is that real one or just for decoration? Oh, man, and, yeah, no, it's a real <laughs> one. Um, it's really funny because I'm a surfer and um, I'm in Cornwall right now, so much closer to the surf. Um, yeah, like that is an interesting indicator as well because um, like in the summer, we don't get the storms, so the surfing isn't as good. So when you see the surfboard there, it means I haven't been surfing. <laughs> okay, yeah. Unfortunately, that's what it means. Um, the hair is still frizzy and, and salty, but just not like from surfing. So yeah, um, there may be days where you don't see it there. That, that, that would have been a good day. But yeah, um, in the summer months, um, yeah, the waves are not as great. They're, they're quite calm, so yeah. Yeah, I guess this is not really off topic, right? I mean, uh, I guess one of the... Uh, earlier streaming processing engine is called Storm, right? I guess maybe from Twitter. <laughs> yeah, and uh, like stream, uh, I mean, we're talking about ocean, I like wave. Uh, yeah, by the way, that's, I'm also a big fan of uh, not surfing, but board game, a, a border, uh, physical board in general. Like for example, I, I, uh, I enjoy like skateboard for a while. I still do uh, snowboarding almost every winter. I did a bit of uh, surfing in in Miami, uh, LA. I, I guess also Toronto. Uh, there's uh, maybe only one one city in entire Canada can do surfing. Uh, I did it last last year, not this time. But again, uh, even like surfing give me some kind of inspirations, right? Because you might keep reading the books about hey, this wave, next wave. But when you in the middle of the sea, you see the wave, and you realize why this is a great uh, kind of a metaphor because you do have to kind of figure out whether this wave is for you can you handle it is that too big for you is that uh, uh you undermissed it maybe it looks small but if you be very smart you know it can be bigger that you, you prepare yourself and how to like uh, work with others how to read the weather all those things it's somehow related to some of the part of the work of our, our everyday right yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it is really a complex sport, like when you factor in meteorology and physics and everything into it, not just the fact that you're dancing on this board as well at some time. So, yeah, and some really interesting metaphors there. I mean, like right place, right time, you know, that's one, um, you know, remembering, you know, the little things don't matter. You're just a drop in the ocean. Sometimes, like, I feel very small out there, which is a very humbling thing. Um, and then there's yeah, no really, my, there's no really good sorry, time, yeah. bad time, right? For example, like... Uh, it's always nice to have like a sunshine day, a very warm, uh, you, you enjoy that for sure. But sometimes if it's raining, even raining hard, actually it's not that bad. I mean, I guess you may agree that is You're because really you, wet. you get wet anyway, right? And uh, there are less people, yeah. so as long as you can handle it. So it kind of similar to like staff company, like there's no really good time or bad time or any time work or any time you get other challenges. So just, just do it. <laughs> Yeah, and there's always another wave, like you miss that one, there's another one, like you just got to be patient, right? And, and like, some of my best surf sessions have been when I didn't take many waves and I just kind of sat out back and I was like calling waves for other people saying, you know, get ready, get on your board, like helping others. I feel like those are some of my best sessions because everyone is having a good time. You can just feel it in the air. And to me, that's really what the spirit of surfing is. It isn't about maximum surf time. It isn't about getting a maximum number of waves. It's about like you know, turning up somewhere, feeling the vibe and going with it. So, um, yeah, like it's, yeah, it's such a complex thing because surfing is different things to different people, right? So it's interesting to hear, you know, your philosophy on it. And um, it's funny how people who like the trinity of boards, you got skateboard, snowboard um, <laughs> and surfboard, like how we all find each other is or how you're like, hey, 
like I'd like to you know have you guest on like my podcast and we're going to talk about coffee and you already had me at coffee I'm like I will go on any coffee podcast so if you're a coffee <laughs> podcast out there and you want to talk just about coffee or and or tech I'm there like I love it um, and likewise for surfing and any other board sports because I really got into snowboarding in the last kind of like 12 months as well so I go like every year now as well so I love that change in my life <laughs> yeah be- nearest, um, so, so where is the nearest one for you for snowboarding uh, for me, I mean, I live in Vancouver, right? So it's it's super. There's a there's a saying called "Sea to Sky," which is you can drive like 20 minutes to the sea, 20 minutes to the uh, to the mountain, uh, right? So for snowboarding, it's it's fantastic because when I was in, I didn't live in Bay Area, but I travel a lot there, right? So sometimes I even travel every month, and uh, uh, I guess it may take four or six hours to go to like Tahoe, right? So. But it's very convenient here in Vancouver. There are some local mountains. If you want willing to drive for two hours, you can go to Whistler, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, and actually, uh, I I've been in Vancouver for five years or six years. But anyway, I did. I the the snowboard some snowboarding part actually is one of the key motivation <laughs> for me to 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 live here. It's very nice. And by the way, all the all the people, all the food is awesome. Um, yeah, and by the way, besides the those uh, snowboard, skateboard, uh, uh, surf, I I have to do other other board such as kanban board or agile board, but it's not that fun. Well, I'm but. learning so much about you. You're obsessed with boards. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't play board game uh, too much. Uh, <laughs> I, I got into board games a bit as well, like um, during lockdown, like so many of us did, and like yeah, I'm trying to keep that going because yeah, it's it's a game like you know, the mindset of streaming and all, like my job is fast, but like, I like my life to, (laughs) my real life to be kind of slow in some ways. So like Mm -hmm. slowing things down and enjoying that slowing down with friends around board games. It's just like, um, I I discovered I really enjoy. So yeah, there's there's something for everyone as well. There's like so many were created in the last few years as well. So I'm sure you can find something that's a good like niche maybe or something that you might like in board games. Yeah. And maybe we can talk Back to the, the data or streaming topic, and uh, uh, you, you, you primarily based in Europe, right? Maybe in different cities. Um, I'm, I'm not, I only travel to Europe maybe twice. Uh, do you think there's a, a, a kind of a pattern or trend, or there's anything different uh, than, say, compared to US or Asia regarding data streaming at a different stage, or how people? What's their expectation? What's their assumption? Right. Can you share me about that? Yeah, I mean, I know a little bit about the US. I guess I can speak more for, for Europe because I've traveled around a bit there. Um, Asia um, is like a whole other world I'm learning. <laughs> like, um, I think I saw like a, there was like a podcast for an interview recently about um, developers um, from China, like what they work on. It's a very different scale. They care about um, different aspects of software engineering, like um, scalability, high availability, things like yeah. that and a whole different tool chain, like things like, um, was it like Dolphin? Like that's been used a lot, Airflow, like not so much. Like a lot of the things that we take for granted as the de facto and as normal in Europe, I'm seeing different uh, across continents. But I guess Europe isn't that, we're not completely different to um, the US, I would say. Um, In terms of streaming adoption, um, I feel we're all in the same boat. (laughs) I look at the US, I look in Europe, very similar companies to us, very similar companies to you. They're all like around Europe and the USA. Um, I think it's a really interesting time. I mean, this this is why I love being in this job right now. It's because I feel that it's about to happen. We don't know when, but we're giving it like, you know, in the next one to two years, I think, like there'll be some serious adoption. And whenever I see really interesting things in the news, um, like LLMs is obviously the very big Um, splash that we've received recently. So for large language models, there became a very big focus again on data quality. And, you know, in my previous roles where we talked about governance and data quality, that was all I talked about. And it was, you know, often it does fall on deaf ears. They're like, data quality, you know, this is good enough. But, you know, they don't realize that errors and problems compound over time, right? So I I feel like there is that mindset shift because people are like, oh, maybe we should think about data more. 
And I love when companies like Databricks come along and you know they take out big ads where it says you are a data and AI company. You know, they just make that claim, and so everyone's like, okay, I guess we are. So how do we do it? So I, I love that all that is shifting, and that's only really been like in the last six to twelve months, right? Like, I, like, do you see it the same way, or what are some interesting or curious things you're seeing coming out of Europe? Uh, yeah, I, again, you, I guess you mentioned uh, China, right? Uh, China is my hometown, and uh, yeah, I do uh, watch closely about that community. Um, also, there's also some similarity for China and the US. For example, they are very big uh, community, a lot of uh, engineers, or they have relatively larger technology uh, companies such as like Meta or Google, right? But I'm not quite mm. sure. Yeah, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. In in Europe, um, I'm sure there are some big companies in Europe for sure. But uh, regarding customer-facing website or products, is that more tend to be medium, small, medium size, or a site or service for a niche market or a particular region? Is that a lot of like European-wide, like shopping cent shopping websites or something like a like Netflix or Shopify? Hmm. So your question's really around like the size of the companies? Yeah, it's it's different. I mean, I, I guess in my circles, I tend to see the small to medium. That I think is like, like a lot of the innovation, a lot of the opportunity, especially around streaming, is very much coming from um, the smaller companies and the ones that raise funding like recently. So that tends to be the pattern. Um, but at the same time, you know, what I do see is a lot of the larger companies are kind of like shifting their focus because some of the companies that have been in the game for like, like you used to work at Splunk, like they've been going on for like what are they like nearly like 15 years or something like plus something like that. They've been going on a long time, like all these companies that adopted these technologies and learned from the companies that came before them, um, they're finding new opportunities and um, like, I don't know if you ever did the, um, like, like when you create, you know, companies, you do that um, blue ocean study. Like you, you draw this massive like ocean and you see where everyone, where all the fish are in this. And then you look for where the gaps are, where you should actually be going. And um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of that recently. It's well talked about and like companies are saying like, right, we're only gonna focus on this one thing. Like one of my ex-business partners, um, um, they built a general purpose kind of like um, intelligent email for businesses but then they found their product market fit in maritime so they just doubled down on maritime because like the opportunity was so great and I feel like there's a lot of these smaller companies are you know they're covering a lot of ground in lots of these sort of companies and industries that are quite early on the adoption curve uh, but you know they obviously have the funding um, they certainly have the patience um, but they're also trying to find the right way to do it for them so they're kind of taking their time to learn and get there but when they get there they're very serious about it so I feel like a lot of the European companies are well positioned to capture some of those like larger opportunities. Yeah, and how about uh, like uh, the talent pool, right? I I guess uh, there's a say American dream, or there's a lot of uh, people really want to move to US, work even work very hard, um, try to find a, a balance between uh, the work and life. Um, similarly, in, in China, so. Uh, is that relatively easy to hire a good data engineer or software engineer in, in Europe? Because somehow the product we are all work on, for example, on time plus side, right? And uh, quick for you, to some degree, is try to build a, a platform so that you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be like 10 years experience to, to get things done, right? Uh, potentially can make the, uh, the cost of forming the engineering team uh, way less. Uh, is that... Uh, do you think that's a mess or this a fact that in Europe uh, it's uh, hard to find a, a, a form a new team on data engineering to to build a reasonable, complex and uh, powerful and stable data apps or products? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... I mean, I can certainly speak from like trying to build data teams. That's always been difficult. Like, I think. Um like finding, especially with data engineering, like data engineering is a very interesting one because um, like, I remember the first time I saw someone describe themselves as a junior data engineer, like that to me almost doesn't make any sense because like data engineering comes from 
um, a lot of um, you know software engineering's best practices. And if you're a junior, you just wouldn't be accustomed, or you wouldn't have experienced like the pain of some of these things. So um, I, f I felt that for us, um, we tried to hire seniors for the most part because that's what companies tend to do. You hire seniors, you hire leads, they help you to figure out like the answers. Um, we weren't completely successful at that, and by we, I mean every company like really had difficulty doing that. And so um, we just adopted that whole concept of, you know, um, I don't know if you've heard of like servant leadership, but the whole like how you create environments as a leader, do you serve your people? So um, we kind of drank from like that cup and then said, we're gonna start building the future data engineers. So we all take on, you know, highly promising data analysts who have started trying to learn Python, for example, and showed an aptitude. So we designed really interesting algorithmic interview questions where, um, and they were and they were kind of like pairing interviews. We never did the take home thing. Um, we did like a phone screening and then we'd get them into the office. Uh, this is pre COVID. So get them into the phys physical space with a whiteboard and see how they think about a problem. Because I think that the most interesting data folks, so analysts, um, data scientists, data engineers, don't come from a computer science background necessarily. Like I, I certainly don't, right? But we all think differently, and I think that diversity of thought is the thing that makes uh, a good team for the most part. Um, we'll be covering some of this in like my talk at Current, like <laughs> in a few weeks. But you know, this is all, I always thought diversity was the answer to that, and um, it was popularized in like lots of different things. There's books and servant leadership. Like if you know Simon Sinek, you know he's he wrote a book called uh, Leaders Eat Last, um, which draws on. Um, the concepts from the military, I believe it was, like one of their practices was, you know, the leaders, uh, the higher ranking officials would always create an environment where, you know, their teams would flourish. And so, you know, that came down to meal times as well. They make sure everyone was sat down and had food before they would eat. Um, you know, as an Asian, I think it's the same thing, right? Like we, like, um, you know, certainly in Southeast Asia where I'm from, um, you know, you let your grandparents eat first, you know, you let the, <laughs> el the, the, the oldest at the table, they get to eat first and the young people eat last. It's a very similar concept, right? So I think it's a very nice culture that works well in business. Okay, cool. And you mentioned a couple of things. We can have some follow-up discussion. Uh, one is Python, CQ, and the Current, right? By the way, I, I do, I know that there's uh, only two uh, Kafka summits one in maybe US, the other is in maybe UK, London, right? So, London, uh, yeah. so I, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, momentum and uh, a big uh, community for people uh, in Europe using Kafka, using uh, other data streaming, using Flink. So yeah, I, I, I hope I will visit uh, or join that conference next year or sometime soon. And uh, so talking about current, so uh, what's your talk, top, topic exactly? And uh, and is there any other interesting topic you would recommend or looking forward to uh, to attend or listen in person? Yeah, um, I've had a look at some of the schedule. So like our talk, um, so I'm doing a talk um, with um, Mike, who is the CEO and founder of Quix. Um, and our talk is called From Zero to 300 Miles Per Hour in Search of the Promised Land. Um, bit of behind the scenes, I put zero to 60 because that's how you normally measure cars. Like, what's the zero to 60, right? And he was like, no, 300 because his background is F1 and like racing. So yeah. it's really about like the higher mileage, right? Um, so uh, that's the name of our talk. Uh, we're talking about, um, it's, not a, it's not really a technical talk. It's more about, it's I guess philosophical and more on the business side. How do you build teams? And um, when you work with data that's moving very quickly, that you have to get insight and value from very quickly. How do you build teams that can keep up with that? That's kind of like the topic. And so we're gonna draw on our experience of building teams and kind of things that worked for us. Um, spoiler alert, a lot of it is really about um, building an ownership into what you do, like to help people to care, like how do you cultivate that kind of environment? So it's very much cultural, yeah. Okay, cool. How about for you, like what's what's happening with you at Current? Uh, yeah, I submitted a, a Actually, we submit more than one topics, and uh, uh, one of it luckily selected. I know this time it's not easy; like only maybe twenty percent of the topic will be selected. So uh, our the selected topic for us is uh, query Kafka data using SQL. Uh, we talk about uh, why you should do it, uh, what's the option, and uh, what's the coming. And uh, yeah, we, I, uh, me, and uh, our CTO Gang, we had. Uh, Kind of a, a similar talk, but in a much much earlier uh, version, like maybe 
last year in one of our Kafka local meetup. But now we all add a lot of new uh, cover a lot of more other projects. And also I, I tried to bring this uh, this coffee theme into that talk because there are so many options, right? We are not really talking about which one is better, which one is uh, out of date. It's really about what do you want? What's your use case? Are you care about this one? Are you care about the other one? So even sometimes, for example, even myself, I, I drink different kind of coffee uh, even in the same day, right? For example, I might have need a very strong espresso in the morning, but in the afternoon when I do some casual reading, I may just need a, a maybe a maybe a latte or a, a, a kind of a media brew coffee. So it's okay. You can use things together. That's not really black or white. It's the whole uh, spectrum for you to choose based on your use case. Uh, yeah. So I will I will be presenting with Gang on that one on the I guess the second day at noon around eleven I think. Yeah. I, I'm personally really excited for that uh, conference. Right. Not not just being a speaker, but also meeting uh, a lot of people out there. Uh, there'll be a lot of cool product announcements. Uh, uh, potentially we can find some uh, good partners or potential cus uh, uh, customers. But overall, it's just a nice party for all the people who in this space. Yeah, I think it's just a great, great selection of minds. So again, like diversity, there's so much. Um, there's a lot of like flink talks, of, of course, like following the announcement um, at Kafka Summit. So there's a lot of flink. So there's some really interesting ones going on there. Um, I'm a sucker for music. Like I, I play guitar and I really got into music production. Um, and so there is somebody who's going to be attending and um, playing the cello. So he's going to be, I think, hauling the cello all the way from, I think, Europe or somewhere. So wow. um, yeah, like I'll give him a shout out because um, that's going to be a good one. Um, our talk is on, I think it's the second talk on the first day, so or, or, or the third talk, something like that. Cool. We're, we're in the morning, so uh, thankfully, yeah, we don't clash, so I'll come along to yours. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, music and a brand. I, you, you really look like a musician, like a, a, a band person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking about like making content because I've got a friend who's... Um, He's going down the whole, um, like he's also, he's a software engineer, engineering manager, and he's kind of like going through the whole experimentation. And um, it's kind of like startup life. It's really about, um, it's something that our um, head of product uh, talked about, which is like increase the velocity of experimentation. That's mm -hmm. how you get there, right? So you have to assume nothing or rather know that you know nothing and then put it out there especially with something like streaming, which is different things to different people, just get it out there. So for him, he's like, gonna, I'm going to try lots of different things and see how it affects my metrics on TikTok and Spotify and all that stuff. So I love how he's introduced metrics into the whole thing. And um, it was a good reminder of that. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I, I, I'm not sure what they will do this time, but I know in some tech conference, they either invite a, a brand or even have someone like you, like have uh, experience with music and a the brand, they build a sound for that topic of that thing. I, I guess there are some sound for Kubernetes, for some security. I don't know whether there'll be a sound maybe coming from you uh, for data streaming. Maybe, yeah, something to work at. Yeah, I don't know what it'd be. <laughs> it's hard enough picking things like, like I'm, I'm almost like jealous of all these other companies that have animal mascots, <laughs> um, you know, so it's just like, it's just a nice thing to have in, in my opinion. And so I'm just like, it's hard enough thinking of an animal, let alone a sound, because it's just like, will it be an animal sound? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, Kafka is not animal, right? So, but it's still uh, one of unique uh, open source name. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I feel, yeah, for me, like, I love animals. So for me, it's just like, it's got to be an animal. And um, so, you know, the duck DVs out there, we've got, um, you, you know, from the animal kingdom, like tiger beetle, and, you know, you've got a few really good examples out there. And I'm just like, oh, I want to be like them. <laughs> yeah, talking about animal, the, the python itself is animal, right? <laughs> so right. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know whether there's a, a universal recognized animal for uh for secret itself but anyway let's talk about that topic so uh again that that's not really which one's good or bad it's it's more about uh, uh the use case or, or what kind of uh, uh stage the, the team is uh or how urgent it is so uh i guess quick is more kind of a learning towards using python is that right as the main building block i i Correct, I, yeah. I i checked um, the 
uh, the website, you you have a nice uh, self service uh, set up product. I guess there's a lot of uh, infrastructure as a code, right? You have a sample Git project maybe, and uh, some Python. Yeah, show me more about uh, like how how Python is in this entire stack and. Uh, uh, any feedback from the users regarding uh, the dev developer experience? Mm. I think the experience is um, it's just really about that feeling of knowing what the logic is. Like you know, this data is coming in, and you just want to write code, and you want that code to run somewhere. So um, that's really like what Quix is all about. We take care of a lot of um, the things you ordinarily don't want to deal with, like you know when you're a developer and you've written code and you've written um, this amazing application, the journey then starts for you to deploy it and put it somewhere so you've got all these decisions to make and then you've got to worry about security and good DevOps practice. So um, one of the things like that got me really thinking about with Quix is you can just focus on the code and then start learning best practices for how do you become a better Python developer? Like how do you write better code? How do you write um, better Docker files? How do you, you know, how do you distribute your code like better? Like you can start thinking about that, but have a platform like Quix manage all of that for you. So we take away that pain, and and that makes us really good for POCs, for companies who are like, we want to try streaming, but like I don't want to, you know, don't know where to start. And so, you know, the, whenever we have booths like um, at places like Kafka Summit, um, it's sometimes easy because we just say, well, what language you code in? If they say Java, they're definitely not for us. Um, if they say SQL, then there's uh, something in between. But if they're Python, then we're saying, like, what's your favorite Python library? It becomes a very different conversation. Because any Python library that they like, like Pandas, Polars, we say, yep, it's a requirements.txt file, like in our world, because it's, it's a Docker image. And we manage the containers for you. So we manage the difficult thing of Kubernetes and pods and everything. So now you just have to think about the dependencies for your logic and for your application. So um, for us, we're just extremely quick because um, we have um, that abstraction for you. And um, the other thing is, um, if you're familiar with um, AWS Lambdas, like the concept of handler logic that you know, gives you exposure to a context and like, you know, in a queue of messages, that kind of thing, um, we make that really accessible to you by giving you all of that. So we're kind of a bit like AWS Lambda. We're, we essentially handler, co handler code but with the power of something like AWS Fargate, where you don't have, you know, like the 15 minute duration limits, you can just run any code for an indefinite amount of time to, you know, always deal with an unbounded like data stream. So, um, yeah, hopefully that made sense. But that's kind of like our, that's kind of like our philosophy on that. Like, just make it really easy to take code that's running in a notebook or on your machine and get it into production. Nice, nice, and uh, yeah, it's always fascinating to see there are so many libraries out there uh, for Python, right? And uh, they even may have a different uh, version with keep uh, improving the performance and usability. Even some of, the, some of the new Python library is backed by some Rust engine. So it still have an uh, interface as Python, but it can be run very, very fast. But, uh, but because I guess Quix is more like uh, a SaaS, right? So how do you guys handle the concern I'm not sure why that's a valid concern. That is, if people put arbitrary code, Python code, then whether there's another way for them to escape from the the container or do some kind of a resource uh, kind of a consuming stuff, noisy neighbors. Do you think that's something you can share with us? Yeah. So. Um you know, when you work with, um, in the industries that we work with, um, you know, security is of utmost concern for them. So, um, again, because, you know, as a startup, you kind of find the right balance, right? So, um, like, I can share, like, one of the things we're looking at is secrets management, for example. But there are obviously ways around that. Like, you can um, deal with it through variables and other ways. But there's lots of things like that. Um, in terms of breaking out of containers and stuff, like, we've got the best minds on it. So, like, we always monitor for problems like that. Um, in terms of resource usage, um, we do the same as well. We, we're quite permissive in that because like in the early days, we just want to see what people do. So we, we make it quite per permissive. 
um, certainly for enterprise customers, you know, there's isolation, so like there won't be any issues there. But for most trial customers, like I don't imagine any of them are running, you know, before they've even put in a credit card, I don't think they're running anything on production. A lot of it's POC. So for, for a lot of that stuff on the same tenant, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, um, we've got exciting news, hopefully at the end of the year around a lot of that, around security. But um, as you start scaling up, you know, as you get more customers, you start listening to their security needs and you start prioritizing those. So those are now emerging for us. So um, we have to spend a bit more time on that in the kind of rest of the year. So um, yeah, it's always that balance, like who, who needs what, when? <laughs> yeah, that's the most important. Low hanging fruit, right? Like for you, it's the same thing, I guess. It's like, there are so many, like you're, you're extremely exposed, right? But like, what do you focus on first? Yeah, that's, that's so true. That is, uh, for example, on our side, um, we don't really have anyone with junior title, right? Again, we, we don't really care too much about in title, but as a fact, that is most of us, uh, we work at least uh, maybe eight years, some, some, some folks even 20 years. So uh, there's a lot of things we can do, we know how to do, but uh, the problem is whether it's the right time to do it or should we do it in an okay way for certain stuff or try to be perfect if you try to be perfect every single thing, meaning that is, you cannot do anything good, right? There's a, such a long backlog for stop company. Um, yeah, so also on, on the topic about uh, QC slash production, um, I guess right now, Quick is more like a cloud-based solution. Do you think there's some uh, requirement or direction to support uh, purely on-premise or bring your own cloud kind of uh, deployment? Yeah, really good question. It's like you have access to our Slack. <laughs> no <laughs> way. That's exactly like this is a daily discussion and um, yeah, customers ask for that all the time. Um, and it's funny, like my observation is when you give talks at conferences, um, one of the first things people will say is, can I run it on my machine? <laughs> that's, always what, that's how developers think, right? And that's fair. Um, so Quix is, um, it's, it's the platform, it's a SaaS platform. And it's also um, an open source uh, client library. So it's a Python client library as well. So some people are just using the client library in their own infrastructure. Um, others are using SaaS, um, knowing that you know, by the end of the year, the thing that we are working towards is bring your own cloud. So um, there are several ways we can deploy as well, but um, you know, the kind of, the thing that we're heading towards with Quix is um, because we have persistence, um, you know, it's like, we're quite open about the fact that we use InfluxDB under the hood. That's how we deal with our persistence. And that gives you, you know, time series. It gives you those visualizations and a way to query the data, right? Um, but some other people, uh, some other customers come to us and say, well, we use BigQuery, so, you know, can I have that go directly to BigQuery instead? Or someone will say, well, I have InfluxDB, and, like, now that InfluxDB 3.0 has come out, um, they're like, can I use that? And that's going to be a cloud or, you know, an on-prem kind of, like, vendor solution. So it's like, how do I use those two together? Um, in the early days, you build connectors, which is just code, goes over, you know, the internet. Um, and with things like um, like the Confluent integration that we had um, as a Confluent partner recently, we built deeper integrations so that it doesn't go over the wide open like a public internet. Um, so, yeah, like it's really about like that exposure again. It's like going over the public internet, like all that stuff being like on the same like tenants with other like you know sharing you know essentially like memory addresses with other customers, you know, things like that. They're all concerns. So, um, being with a deploy on-prem is a big thing. It's often asked about for us. So I think it's almost like you can't really even be a stream processing company without that capability because um, you don't want to have your data come going somewhere, processed and then coming back because that adds latency. And when we're talking about F1 and racing, <laughs> you know, if there's a second up there, a second back, that's already um, too long. So having it on-prem and, you know, leveraging things like edge tech, you know, things at edge, processing at edge, like you want to have all those things because the people who want it really fast, they want it really, really fast, like sub 10 milliseconds, you know, they're really, really fast. So they have to be on-prem yeah. and um, deal with like network outages, things like that, of course. So um, yeah, um, are, are you finding the same thing? Are your, are your kind of customers and potential customers saying the same thing? They're like, you're a SaaS, but where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, as of today, 10 plus, we, uh, we primarily offer the SaaS as the default uh, option. 
Uh, but that's also true that uh, some of our clients they are talking about. I'm not. I I, I already have a solution for maybe two second latency. Can you do twenty milliseconds? If so, maybe we can have a discussion. <laughs> Otherwise, I I don't want to like rebuild my solution. So, uh, they they have a very strong uh, low latency requirement, and also many of them. For example, we do have some clients on the fintech area, right? So. They have a very uh, conservative policy. Even they cannot uh, create a, a sample file with uh, information uh, detected, right? Removing or, or say, can you send me a sample file about your schema? Removing some sensitive information, but they say no. Even a sample file need a lot of uh, process or review. So they have a strong preference to pull everything on prem uh, to get a lower latency, to get a higher performance. Uh, to don't uh, don't share the file to uh, outside world. Uh, also, some other auditing perspective. So um, yeah, so we we, we did uh, work with them to have a, a on prem. By the way, that is when we design time pass. Uh, we know leveraging whatever from AWS or from other cloud vendor will be kind of a modern and uh, a fancy way or even an easy way. You can just uh, don't worry about uh, database. For example, you're using the Aurora RDS, using Lambda, uh, using S3, uh, using IAM role. This is cool, but uh, we we do a kind of uh, expect we should support Edge. Maybe not really a focus today for Time Plus, but uh, uh, our yeah. our engine is very compact. It's uh, with a low footprint. There's no reason we cannot support Edge. We can should be more ready than many other solutions, but uh, we just uh, don't have enough time and resources. People focusing on too many things in the same time. So not edge is not really a priority for us, but it's certainly doable. So the long story short, that is when we design our uh, define our component, defining this uh, data flow control flow, making sure we don't really have any kind of uh, vendor lock to AWS to GCP. Uh, even we don't really want to add too many feature, use too many feature from Kubernetes. Right? Otherwise. You might have to lock on Kubernetes, which is can be all right, but uh, also add uh, a lot of uh, dependencies. What if people just want to run it on uh, bare minimal or using Docker Compose? Uh, for example, uh, you're talking about developer experience. I guess it is very reasonable ask for a developer to run your stuff or run a, a stuff, a software on their own Mac talk, MacBook or on Linux, no matter using. Homebrew or using Docker, using Kubernetes is okay, but uh, I know some company providing uh, Kubernetes Helm chart, something like that as a uh, getting started. But if you can provide a Docker image or a Docker post, it looks much lightweight and easy to, uh, to give feedback. So that's something we, we are going to also going to announce later this year, hopefully around the conf, uh, around the, the current. Um, yeah, because okay. Data engineer, platform engineer is really our target persona, right? So uh, already have a very nice web UI or self-service or even credit card uh, in our uh, cloud version. But uh, I guess only small percentage of data engineer willing to like using the cloud version or put their credit card there. So they, they will be more comfortable using a Docker version on localhost. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we went through similar learnings as well, even in you know the short time that I'm here, because um, it seems like Quix is for you know platform or data engineers, right? Because like data, you know, data engineers build pipelines. That's what they do. But like um, you know, like certainly my background is data engineering was on other tools um, that are kind of like JVM based, like Spark, and you know later in later years like in PySpark. But um, they want to build all the infrastructure generally. Like as a data engineer, you don't necessarily want to use this tool. So we found that this tool actually benefits software engineers, you know, application developers, because they, they want to build these apps. They know that they need to work with data. Um, they know that they want to build pipelines to do that. But the end product is some sort of application running somewhere. And we make that completely like doable in a single platform. Um, and it's kind of funny because like you can just run applications. It's just a container, right? So you you know you have an entry point. You run an application, and it just runs indefinitely, like on our on our servers. That's kind of it, and we manage that for you. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of like the turns you make, you know, in startup life. You like we think it's for this persona, and then you test it and you try it out, and it resonates with a different persona. So um, yeah, like I think we're still learning with that. So um, you know, Quix came from largely time series data. So like we're really really good at handling time series data and all the problems you get with like things like sampling and imputing values, things like that. You get the benefits of all of that expertise. But we found that you know things like event streaming that has broad appeal. Like event driven architecture is something people don't normally care about. You know the timestamp. They care about things happening at non regular intervals, like things just happening, um, click streams, things like that. So um, we found that hey, you know we're good for them too. So let's show them some love. Let's give them some education and give them a way of. Um, using our platform more easily. So that's kind of like our current focus, but it's interesting, like, we, I think we did the same thing. Data engineer, we're for data scientists. No, we're not, we're for platform engineers. I think it's like a constant thinking and yeah, like it's good to have like that initial focus anyway, like you say, like to focus on a persona and target them and make sure, you know, you're serving them as well as you can. Yeah, it's like, exactly. I, I guess, uh, I guess almost every, Stop coming. They have some kind of a discussion also regarding ICP, the ideal customer profile, or like your target persona, your customer journey, or some some company even put this on the website. But I I still see some early stage company their website saying, "Hey, we we support the following five personas <laughs> from from data engineer to data scientist, to, and, and this is why." But uh. I'm not saying this is impossible, but it's very hard, very, very hard for a stop company to support all different personas. And yeah. I, I, I can share that is uh, for a while in 10 plus, we do expecting to support the main persona as we call it streaming data analysis. Even that can be a thing. I, I, I guess I, I have a, some slide deck for that, but, <laughs> but, but later on, I guess it is not really the, the right time to have such a persona as our main persona because um, for example, the, our, the current thinking is that is the data engineer and platform engineer is our main persona. Um, the difference, I guess, is maybe data engineer, they really care about moving data from A to B with certain kind of uh, transformation, cleanup. Uh, they are primary language might be SQL, but also can set up other systems and that the platform engineer maybe is more mm. hands-on, as you mentioned, that is, they are essentially just software engineers, right? They, they really wanted to to build a system and use whatever tool available. And uh, they don't really care too much regarding maybe dashboard or even alerts. They just want making sure have a very high performance and robust uh, uh, data pipeline or, or kind of a program or cluster somewhere. So that, that's that's really our focus, but regarding regular data analysts or even data scientists who are not so hands-on regarding coding, but uh, use SQL a lot, using Python a lot, uh, try to figure out some pattern or number detection, that not really our major persona, right? And uh, the reason that is, again, there's a lot of debate regarding ELT, ETL, I even saw some talk regarding that's a way called uh, ETLT <laughs> uh, with, a, seen that one too, yeah, yeah. With, with a smaller T at the front and a bigger T later. Ch oh, wow. uh, yeah, there, there's some good uh, reason behind it. For example, like the, the, the first, if we're talking about that uh, uh, ETL, ETLT, the first three letter is for one one team really to grab data from database using CDC, do some basic and minimal transformations, uh, not really for analysis, not really to try to get a, a kind of a, a report, try to just clean up, do the column mapping, do the necessary join. Then they finish this uh, as transformation, then send this to a different system. And the, the, the last T, which is a bigger T, is for a different team. Primary is uh, data scientist or data analyst. They, they just write very huge SQL or using uh, a lot of uh, Python library to figure out what's the, what's, how the clustering works like, what's the um, pattern, how to, what's the protection. 
they already assume data is there and the data is in a good quality. So yeah, you can you can you can argue that is in some organization it can be just a single team, but in many cases they are just two different teams. So the data engineer don't really care about how data uh, analysis to write to the SQL as long as I can give you enough uh, and the fresh data to you. That's your job, not my job. And my job is making sure that the, there's no data loss. Uh, this is low latency. I, I, I support a certain kind of uh, data schema drift. Then for the mm. data analysis, they really care about uh, uh, the, the SQL part, the BI part, or maybe other kind of uh, leveraging certain uh, library from Python. So um, at least this is current to my preference that is uh, we really can help data engineer and data uh, pipeline engineers to set up uh, great uh, real-time data pipelines or being part of their system to to uh, connect the dots, making the data flow. But we, we do provide certain kind of uh, real-time data exploration, or even we have some dashboard and chart in our system. But the goal is not really build the other, say, real-time version of uh, Tableau. That's not really our goal. So in the end, the data still needed to go to somewhere like uh, maybe Apache, uh, Pino, or Snowflake, then the other group of people, they're using SQL, using other SQL notebook and visualize in a nice way. So um, it's very hard to support maybe five or even 10 different persona in an early stage company, I would say, yeah. It's true. And those like, even data engineer means a different thing in so many places, yeah. right? Um, like when I started in data engineering, it was very much about JVM and Python and very little SQL, but I'm reading about people who like are data engineers and they do SQL maybe 80% of the time, like most of their time is actually writing SQL, which makes me think it's, you're maybe an analytics engineer, you're, you're a different type of like data engineer, but not like the, the data engineer I understand or identify with. So yeah, it's interesting. I think that's still shifting as well. Um, you know, a lot of these companies, um, like the modern data stack, um, like, like companies like Fivetran, they're, they're like everyone's saying, is it ETL, ELT? Like you touched on that and it's like, it's actually like ELT, but before you get to your ELT, there's an ET, there's almost like an ET, L, E, T, and then you get to your <laughs> ELT, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's often like transformations and you can get into that vendors tool much further upstream and create transformations there. So it's almost like irrelevant, like really, we just know that transformation has to happen somewhere. Um, does it happen in the warehouse or does it happen in something like in memory, in stream, like where, where does it go? Um, so I think it's more important to understand things like SLAs, like when does that need to land? Um, what's the value there? Like really like, yeah, that's when you can start unraveling the batch versus stream like choice as well, because both are appropriate. Um, you know, there are definitely like limitations to streams. We all know this because like you don't have access to the full history. Like you generally wouldn't want that, right, to persist all that or keep it in memory. So we're working with certain limitations, but we have so many benefits as well. So I think understanding those is key to it. And um, yeah, I always recommend people just try it out. Like you don't need your credit card anymore for many of these things. We live in that world where you can just sign up and there are so many even ungated experiences. Just like try them out and start like learning. At least then you'll know when you spot the signs, then you won't resist. You're like, well, you know, we could do it this way, but I know about this other way we can do it that I haven't tried out yet, but I have a feeling can work. So, um, and that's sort of like, that's kind of the education path I see for me. It's like, here are some signs of resistance. And here's how you help them to understand that you shouldn't resist and micro batch it like to a fault. Um, because that's always, that's always been the case. They're like, oh, we will just batch faster. We'll micro batch faster. Then we don't need streaming. But you know, the underlying thing is as long as there's no adverse effect to your system in doing that, I guess it's tolerable, right? But Again, you're reading all that data into memory. You're reading all your logic into memory. You're doing all that multiple times, like every minute or so. Is that the correct way to use your resources? There's also that too. So yeah, there are bigger discussions to be had, but I think, you know, with, in a company, like you're putting out many fires, 
day to day, right? That's the reality. And so you don't want to introduce another technology so easily. So I, I get that too. So um, it's about lowering that barrier through just comfort and education, I feel. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll get there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, there's always a new things to, to explore. And, uh, but on the other hand, you don't really have to reinvent the wheel over and over again, right? So it's just possible you can just uh, process data from like Kafka or from IoT Gateway. You just uh, read them in your memory. You build a hash map in, in your, and then you do all the kind of group by or kind of uh, aggregation by yourself. It is not impossible, but you don't really have to do that. I mean, there's a lot of reason why there's a special software the web open source or commercial doing that. And uh, I'll give it a try. I, I, get, I know this is a really a terrible metaphor to invite people trying streaming, just like inviting my daughter, she is uh, 12 years old, to try coffee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she's she's now more like a milk tea, bubble tea person. But uh, I, I try to say, hey, uh, can you try this? Uh, I, I made this uh, decaf latte. It tastes very good. Do you want to try it? <laughs> So uh, yeah, she watched. Like I accidentally <laughs> ordered you a bubble coffee, and like, like just try it. You know, it's got a lot of sugar in it. It's got a lot of milk in it. Yeah, it could work, right? <laughs> you never know. Yeah, I'm a big bubble tea drinker as well. But like, I found like over the years, um, and you know, it's the same thing. Like you, you, as a kid, you don't like beer. You don't like bitter things like coffee. You like sweet things. And like over time, I just like reduce sugar. And so when I'm in these coffee shops and like tea shops, and seeing everyone asking for extra sugar like that just <laughs> it, would, it just sounds undrinkable to me <laughs> so that's probably what you're going through now with your your 12 year old she's probably like yeah just bump up the sugar yeah like more pearls like <laughs> yeah. more cream all that but again I'm, I'm not really trying to like piss off uh or i respect all the people using like the batch or micro batch i'm not saying like batch is bubble tea streaming is coffee fancy I mean, that's not really good or bad, right? But uh, uh, give it a try. If you think uh, there's some open source or commercial tool or free trial or free tier, you can try to help you really get your hands a little bit dirty regarding uh, the capability of that software and somehow have better connection with your day-to-day -day data or job. Have a try. It, it doesn't cost anything, maybe some time. And uh, yeah, explore different options. And it is perfectly okay to have different components for different purposes, right? Uh, I know at a certain certain level, you don't really want to manage like say, 20 different uh, framework uh, in a single team, that might be too much. But uh, yeah, I mean, we have to keep up and uh, try to find a good balance regarding like buy or build, whether you maintain by yourself or mm. some el something else is to ma maintain for you. Yeah, it, that's, that's, so that's, 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 like that's part of the, the life as a, also the, the fun part of the data engineer or software engineer, right? You have to keep, keep learning. Uh, you never get bored. Yeah, and, and, like, and like finding different combinations that some, you know, it's like greater than the sum of its parts. Like one of the questions I have for you is um, in, you know, a single pipeline, you know, from one side to the other, how do you see, you know, something like Quix, which is like, I guess, a stream processor working alongside a streaming database? Like, how do you see that working together? Yeah, sure. I think that can be many ways to work together. For example, uh, using Python, using customer code, allow you to even have a better integration with your own algorithm or model, right? So this is not really can be done in uh, SQL, right? For example, SQL, you can always stuff like UDF, which is user defined function. You can even call it oh, Lambda. support UDFs as well. Yeah, yeah, we, we do have uh, remote so. UDF and also in process UDF. So you can set up your own web service to, or using just using AWS Lambda as your remote UDF. Or if you prefer something quicker, you, you can using our uh, in process UDF, which is right now based on JavaScript uh, using the, the Google V8 engine, something similar to the, the web assembly. So you don't spend time and effort on the network traffic, Marshall, Marshall, everything is in process. But even so, I, I will, I, I, I have to admit that it's using Python, using uh, customer code will be more sophisticated on certain use cases. So. If, if you do have such requirement to have data from different places, you need to do some join, you need to do some cleanup, 
uh, but also you need to do certain kind of advanced uh, and customized processing. One one approach is using tools like Time Plus or using other systems to do that data injection part, transmission part, streaming part. Then uh, you can send data to the other, say, Kafka topic, or send to uh, OLAP system, right, such as uh, Starbucks or, uh, or uh, the Pino. Then you can read it from uh, Quicks again, right? Do that, do that final kind of touch to have apply a more advanced algorithm that should be totally doable. A similarly, seeing that is uh, there can be some use case for for people to use both Time Plus as other systems such as uh, Flink, right? So each one has its own kind of a very unique way. Uh, so for the machine learning, for some larger scale stuff, maybe Flink is very nice, but uh, for some data processing or even super low latency stuff, Time Plus can be a better fit. So again, there should be a lot of uh, a possibility to combine certain tools together uh, to to make sure your entire solution is uh, uh, cost effective and uh, easy to maintain. Yep. Yeah, that's a good answer because um, I mean, for us as well, like we to you know re to remove all the barriers to trying out like streaming technology and using a stream processor. Like we have a managed Kafka as well. Like we have you know our own version that you can just use out of the box if you don't have your own, right? Um, but that's not the game we want to get into. We don't want to be like, you know, Ivan or AWS. We don't want to host like manage Kafka for you, but we want to do it just long enough for you to understand its benefits. And then, you know, if you want to take it to production, you should absolutely go with a company that does it professionally, you know, for example. Um, and we often find, you know, for us, like we want people to bring, like the example I gave earlier, we want you to bring your own InfluxDB. We want you to use your own BigQuery. Um, and it's the same thing. Like, when you think about um, an organization, that data needs to appear in different places, right? In different forms. And you will have an analytics team or some commercial team that needs to look at it. They're not gonna look at it in Quicks. They're gonna look at it in a database, you know? A, a, something that's purpose-built for their function that suits their skills. So that's kind of, um, like we play into that as well. It's kind of like, yes, you absolutely should. Because what we are focused on is creating that ecosystem that makes all of that easy. So that's it. And, you know, two days ago they announced, um, Microsoft announced that they're supporting Python now in Excel. So we also live in that world. So, like, all bets are off, like, because now you can do everything in Excel. So, like, we might as well quit now. <laughs> yeah, Excel is the best BI tool in the world, period. No discussion. <laughs> yeah, there's, like, yeah, like, all the efforts to remove, like, spreadsheets from any company I've been in, there's always one somewhere that's fueling a dashboard somewhere that someone is making decisions on and that's just the way it's going to be so i love that they just went okay let's just do the final bit and it's going to be successful for sure mm -hmm. and um and how different is that to and it almost feels like a response to you know these companies like airtable like notion um, which is basically a database into a into a document and airtable being like all these data sources going into a data a, a, like a spreadsheet right so I think, yeah, these are all converging now. People want to use data in different ways in tools they're comfortable with. Um, and so, yeah, like if more people are learning Python, I'm really happy. <laughs> so that's kind of what I want. Um, how about your 12-year-old? Is she showing any um, curiosity around programming? Do they teach Python at school? Uh, what's happening there? Yeah, there, there's a, some fun elements also a little bit kind of uh, personal that is. For example, my wife, uh, she's, uh, she, she studied in English, right? And uh, so I feel it's very difficult for the parents, maybe just me, but I feel at least in our family, it's very difficult for my wife to teach more about English to my daughter. It's very difficult for me as a father to teach like programming to the kid. She prefer having someone outside the family <laughs> to teach her to assign the homework. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. It's different. <laughs> yeah, and again, she uh, she's now more about into this like K-pop or mm. those uh, <laughs> TikTok things. She wants to be a dancer, <laughs> not a programmer. I mean, like, um, that's like a lot of us, I think. Like, uh, it's funny because my brother, like you know, like being Asian, and I come from a family like of doctors. So 
like being the elder of the two, it was always like, you're going to be a doctor. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I went down the, you know, the biology, the genetics path and now in computing. And my brother just went, all right, all pressure on him. You're going to be the doctor. And he was like, you're going to be a dancer. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. Uh, so I respect that. Um, I think you've got to find, yeah, you've got to find that reason that lets you get up in the mornings, right? And sometimes it's a good cup of coffee. And sometimes it's, you know, putting headphones on and coding and I've been there I've been in both those places so yeah and uh, even think you know, that K-pop's great yeah, as well yeah last time you mentioned <laughs> there's even a term uh, cafe to code right C2C oh, <laughs> yeah yeah that was something my friend introduced yeah C2C yeah more powerful than uh, B2B um, <laughs> yeah technically like so um, on one of my previous teams like uh, yeah my friend Eric um, he was just like, right, we have to, and, and this plays into the whole servant leadership thing. It's like, we have to provide coffee for our people because a developer's job is to turn coffee into code. <laughs> That's always what he would say. And so, um, you know, I practiced that servant leadership by making sure I made coffee every morning or, and once again in the afternoon after lunch, just to make sure everyone was topped up. And uh, yeah, that was my way of practicing it. That got me really into, you know, that philosophy of it. Um, but yeah, I think coffee and decode is a universal thing. And the, even in America, like I, I'm sure they practice that still, right? Yeah, but I, I also okay to change the C to B, right? Which is beer. But anyway, yeah, I even saw some Not study. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah, beer, like, yeah, that's a different, yeah, that's a different one. Like if you're looking for innovation, maybe I would recommend that. <laughs> it wouldn't just be productive. Like maybe like bubble tea is the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Again, I'm so so glad to cover so many topics today. Um, do you see? Do you have any other thing you want to like recommend to the people who listen or watch this episode? Yeah, um, I mean, we, there's a lot of things happening with streaming, and a lot of people are very curious about it. Um, and there are so many options now, more than we've you know ever had probably in the history of, of technology. So um, you know, we've got companies um, you know with streaming databases we've got companies who have different you know allowing streaming in rust in python in lots of different languages so um, there's no there's no reason for you not to take that leap and start understanding it more so um, yeah my my dms are always open like i i will go on any podcast to talk about coffee i'll talk about streaming anyway so um, yeah for me i'd just love to talk to more developers just to understand use cases like where where they're at with their data because i think um like streaming and batch like it is a maturity curve um like i built a lot of my career in consulting and the first thing you do as um, like a head of data or even as a CDO is you arrive and you do this thing called a data maturity assessment where you have, you essentially, it's a questionnaire that you um, ask um, several like different roles in the company and you try to get an understanding of where the company is at now today with their data. And um, yeah, like with that, I think it taught me like everyone is at a different stage and you just have to respect the stage they're at and try and help them all in some way. So I feel like a lot of people who watch this are probably like, what's Quicks? What's a streaming database? Maybe they're at that point. Um, maybe they've never signed up or tried it. So I would say just sign up, try it. Um, a lot of us um, at these companies were very open to having conversations like this. So send us an email, like add me on LinkedIn, you know, add Joe on LinkedIn. This is like how we really met as well, like through, through this community. So it's a really, really fun community to be a part of. So I'd say get involved, ask questions, and everyone is just so willing to help. So yeah, that's really it. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, seeing is believing. So uh, if you haven't tried those uh, yeah. kind of uh, new tools, yeah, feel free to find the open source project to follow or try some uh, SaaS solutions. Yeah. And uh, Again, uh, if you are not a coffee person, try a very nice uh, decaf latte <laughs> as your first bite. And it's not that terrible to drink. And it's okay for you to drink tea and coffee, a bubble tea, beer, same, same day. Right? Lots of sugar in it, it's fine, yeah. you know. <laughs> you do you. <laughs> yeah, there's no judgment. Uh, yeah, again, there's, a, there's just the, so many things you can explore and maybe can make your life or work slightly easier. And uh, I guess both uh, us will be uh, presenting at uh, current, uh, will be at uh, demo booths uh, in the same time. So if yeah, you happen to visit for sure, yeah, yeah. I need to get pick up a t-shirt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do the usual rounds like um, 
yeah, like who is the best T-shirt? You know, you've got a, it's in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, what, like what what is everyone up to? Who's who's got an animal mascot this year? <laughs> and I turned out also going to check whether there's any nice uh, coffee shop like near the uh, like uh, San Jose uh, Commission Center. Then maybe you can have the other episode together uh, with more guests. Yeah, I'd love yeah. that. We should definitely do that. Awesome. Yeah, we can we can maybe get more people involved. Like. Yeah, see who wants to grab coffee. Like, let's do it. Okay, cool. And uh, enjoy the coffee and the streaming. See you next time. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>